So, <laughs> good morning, everyone, again. Uh, so, thanks, uh, the organizer, for this uh, invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here after, I think, four years or something. Uh, let me get straight to the point. Um, so, I'm, I, was, uh, I was thinking of giving a course on this uh, subject, uh, which is random algebraic geometry. And uh, I plan to give uh, essentially four lectures uh, discussing some themes uh, from the subject. Okay? There is no, uh, mm, I would say, like, a, uh, it, it's a subject that has been uh, developing in the last uh, years. And there are some ideas that I would like to explain. Uh, I have prepared some lecture notes, which I will uh, make available on my webpage, maybe right uh, after uh, this seminar in the afternoon. And uh, I will be very happy if anyone has comments uh, on, on the notes. Uh, and then by the end of the week, I plan to uh, post them on, uh, on archive. So let me start immediately. What is uh, this uh, random algebraic geometry? It's, the idea is very simple. So, it's a, a way of doing algebraic geometry, typically over a field which is not algebraically closed. So it becomes especially interesting when we work on a field which is not algebraically closed. And we will be mostly interested in the case when uh, k is the real numbers, or maybe the periodic numbers. And the idea is that uh, we replace, uh, we do algebraic geometry, but uh, we don't work with uh, the notion of generic, but instead we work with the notion of random. Okay? I will explain what I mean by this okay, during these lectures. Um, so let me start really like, uh, what is the, some preliminary observations? Okay, so this is just going to be some motivation for the study and just to uh, maybe warm up with the feeling of what, uh, what's happening. So when we do algebraic geometry, we usually have, uh, say, some uh, family of objects. Okay, which I denote by P, stands for parameter space. So sometimes algebraic geometers call them moduli space. This could be like a, typically a smooth manifold parametrizing our objects. It could be the Grassmannian of k-planes in Rn. Or it could be uh, the set of homogeneous polynomials of degree d and variables. Or it could be the uh, set of holomorphic sections of some vector bundle. And we're studying, say, properties of these families of objects. For instance, it could be like uh, if we are polynomials of degree d in n variables, the topology of the zero set. Okay? And when we study these properties, we are usually interested in properties that like, depend in a semi-continuous way on our parameter. And typically what we discover is that inside our parameter space, there are some special objects which I call discriminant, okay, where the structure of the property we are uh, uh, studying uh, change. Okay? So this is just the picture. So there is a, a smooth manifold, and there is something inside our smooth manifold, which typically it is a submanifold complex. So a closed set, which is uh, stratified into smooth manifold with a finite stratification. And what is important for, uh, for our story is that we can define the notion of co-dimension of this object, which is just a dimension of P minus the dimension of delta. OK, so this is uh, it's just a general setting that I want, to, I want to set up. So there is a smooth manifold, and there is some object inside this manifold, a union of a bunch of sub-manifolds. And uh, <coughs> this object. We call it the discriminant. 
and it has some co-dimension. Okay, so if this was the blackboard, maybe uh, we have some parameter space, and then we have some discriminant. And I want to record maybe one purely topological fact, which, if you want, it is at the basic of uh, the notion of generic in complex algebraic geometry, and also at the basic of the fact that there is no uh, generic in general, sorry for the uh, words in real algebraic geometry, which is just like purely topological fact, which is the following, that if the co-dimension of delta is at least two, and I'm talking about real co-dimension, then this inclusion is an isomorphism on at the level of the zeroth homology group. So in particular, the number of connected components of P minus delta is the same as the number of connected components of P. Okay, so if you have an object in your parameter space, which is code I mentioned too, what is left when you remove this object is some maybe huge connected open set. On the other hand, if the codimension of your object is, uh, say, 1, uh, then the number of connected components might be, and I stress might be, different. So it is possible that you se separate your parameter space into many connected components. And in fact, maybe a comment, maybe a remark, which is interesting, that if P is Rn, your parameter space is Rn, and delta is an algebraic hypersurface, then it must separate. Okay? And this is due somehow to some topological consideration. So the algebraic hypersurface carries a fundamental class, and then with coefficients over z2, and then you use some Alexander duality to prove that like the number of connected component of p with coefficient in z2, which is the same as the number of connected components, is the same, uh, is different from, uh, from this, okay? So this like, it follows from like the existence of a fundamental class over z2 plus Alexander duality. So it is not, for, all the, um, for most of the problems we're going to be interested in, this is really what's happening. Like I have uh, an algebraic hypersurface in some Rn, and this algebraic hypersurface must separate our space in several components. Yes. Well, sorry, sorry, you're light. Yes, of course. Uh, I, well, I mean, I, I, have to, I want to say, uh, yeah, so let me add some more. Uh, you want to add if it changes sign, maybe. Hmm? But I think it's, uh, it's enough uh, to say algebraic hypersurface. So I should clarify what I mean by hypersurface. Okay? So I really mean uh, that this object uh, is uh, co-dimension one. Okay? So that's what I really mean. Yes? Sorry, sorry, sorry. A fine line minus a point mm -hmm. with respect to dualistic topology is connected. Mm -hmm. But with respect to Euclidean We're going to just be concerned with Euclidean topology. Okay? And of course, I mean, this example, it is of fundamental importance for us. If you do the same over the complex numbers, if you remove just an hypersurface, okay, this is going to be connected. So that's the same business. Uh, okay. So, in, I mean, in this picture, how do we usually uh, work? I maybe wanted to um, put out a simple proposition on the blackboard, which, is, which can be used uh, uh, in most of the cases, and which explains which explains uh, uh, how do we get to the notion of uh, generic and uh, maybe random for a family of objects. So 
the simple proposition is the following, that if you take uh, maybe an algebraic map whereby algebraic, I mean uh, if you are working over C, complex algebraic, and if you work over R, real algebraic. So just uh, either switch, so divide your brain into two chambers. Uh, either you take this statement as a real statement or as a complex statement, okay? So when I write algebraic, I mean either real or complex, uh, and assume that uh, X and Y are compact. Then this is what happens for this type of maps. There exists delta, which is a subset of Y, which has a co-dimension, let's say, one if we are working over the reals, and two if you are working over the complex numbers with the property that if you just look at your map, if you remove delta, this, maps, this map becomes a locally trivial, so it becomes a topological vibration. Topological vibration over each component, of course, of this space. Okay, so what I'm saying is like, suppose, uh, so this is the framework that one usually like uh, sits. We have a map between two uh, uh, algebraic manifolds and it's an algebraic map. So if you want to think about like over the real numbers is given by some uh, uh, poly real polynomial equations. And what I claim is that you can partition the target, you can cut away a piece which we call the discriminant for this map, which has real codimension one in the real, in the real case and real codimension two in the complex case. And over each of what of the connected component remaining, uh, when we remove this set, the map becomes a topological vibration. Okay, so this is the, why I like this. Uh, so somehow you should imagine that, but maybe let me tell you first of all, why this is true. It's quite easy actually. The proof is the following. Take uh, maybe sigma to be the set of critical points of F, and then take delta to be image of the set of critical points. In the real algebraic case, uh, sigma so the, is a, a semi it's a, it's a is an algebraic set. In the complex algebraic case, it's a complex algebraic set. When we take the image of this uh, in the real algebraic case, uh, it becomes a semi-algebraic set. In the complex case, it becomes a constructible set. On the other end, by Sard lemma, this thing must have measure zero inside the target. So when we stratify this set, either if it is semi-algebraic or uh, constructible, it cannot contain any piece of maximal dimension. So it must be made of pieces which have at least co-dimension one. In the real case, that means uh, that it's at least got dimension one. And in the complex case, because it's constructible, it means that each piece at at least got dimension two. Okay, so that's a sketch of the proof. You can find the proof in the notes in a while. Where does, so how do we use this framework usually? So let me give you an example. Uh, take maybe X to be the set of pairs. Uh, so I want to project on Y, so X P in projective space of dimension N times uh, maybe let's say projective space of polynomials of some even degree. So this is the set of pairs such that P of X is zero, okay? So that's a closed algebraic set inside Pn times another Pn. And we take uh, F over Y, which is just uh, the projective space of polynomials. Okay, just a projection. OK, 
Okay, so this is usually called uh, the universal hypersurface. So imagine what we have. Uh, we have uh, the space uh, of polynomials here. This is going to be y, it's our parameter space. And over each polynomial, uh, we have the fiber, which is just uh, the zero set of the corresponding polynomial. Okay, so if you apply now that proposition to this framework, what you will get in the complex case, it is that you find some discriminant inside your space, which has real codimension two. So outside of this discriminant, all the fibers have the same topology, okay? Because uh, I told you it's a topological vibration over each connected component. But if you work over the reals, uh, this discriminant maybe cuts your space into several connected components and fibers, well, they should be real, but uh, okay, might have different topologies. In fact, in this precise case, they do have different topologies. Okay, this picture maybe is more realistic. Okay, so you see, on this side of the blackboard, just this part, we can talk about the generic zero set. So that really means that uh, there exists a generic fiber. So every statement when I say something like uh, uh, the generic fiber is a torus, that means for all the points belonging to our parameter space, except for the discriminant, the fiber is a torus, okay? So if you just take this statement, it has a um, very measured theoretical flavor, okay? Up to a zero measure set, the fiber is a torus. Now, we, can, we cannot say statements of this type on this right of the blackboard. We can say up to a zero measure set, the fiber is smooth. But we cannot say up to a zero measure set, the fiber is something. So there is no generic fiber. So that's the idea. And the idea to switch from random, from uh, um, how do we get to random algebraic geometry is to switching from generic to random. So just insist on the measure theoretic aspect of the notion of generic. So what we do essentially, we add to this picture a probability distribution. Okay, so main idea here. So how do we switch from generic to random? These jokes, I'm destroying them. This really means we endow our parameter space with some probability distribution, some measure, which is a probability distribution. Okay, so it's a Borel measure, positive, with total mass one. You see, we could also do that in this case, but we don't get interesting properties. Because, I mean, whatever reasonable measure you put on this space, and reasonable means absolutely continuous with respect to the bag measure, this set is going to have measure zero, and the complement is going to be full measure. And that's it. So that's all you can do. But if we do this on this picture, then you can start asking for new questions. So, for instance, you can wonder whether in these many open sets, there are some open sets which are larger than others. Or you can ask instead of uh, saying the generic fiber as this topology, you can integrate on your parameter space uh, the function sum of the Betty numbers of the fiber. Okay, so this uh, we would call it the expectation of the topology. Okay, so there is a function b in this case uh, that to every point associates the sum of the Betty numbers of the fibers. There are going to be some uh, 
quantitative result, like the Tom Milner bound, in our case that tell that this function is bounded, so it's integrable, and we can take its integral with respect to our measure. This would be the expectation. As I said, we can ask for, I mean, uh, uh, the size of uh, the largest chamber, or we can ask what is the probability, what is the measure of the set of polynomials uh, or the set of parameters that have some property. Okay, so we could start asking uh, a bunch of new questions, which of course, uh, in the case of complex algebraic geometry, would reduce the classical questions, if you adopt this point of view. Okay, so if we adopt this point of view, uh, this would just become generic algebraic geometry over the complex numbers. Okay? Maybe one comment is that uh, these blackboards are uh, essentially dealing with uh, C and R. This argument that I put on the board doesn't work, for instance, for QP. Okay, so the topology that we take on, uh, on, on uh, Piadic uh, space, it's totally disconnected usually. But you can still prove some similar arguments. So you have to replace uh, what in the, in the real framework is called uh, Tom uh, isotopy lemma with some Ansel lemma. So there are some things that survive. But what survives especially is the fact that when you remove some discriminant, you don't get a generic type. You're going to get a bunch of solutions, a bunch of types. So for instance, if you take a polynomial of degree 3 on QP, well, on C first, generically, we have three roots. On R, generically, we have either 3 or 1. That means uh, outside of the discriminant, the zero set of the polynomial could be either 3 points or 1 point. On QP, it could be 3, 1 or 0, generically. So these three situations happen for an open set in the okay, topology for QP, so away from the discriminant. It means that like if you take a polynomial and you perturb it a little bit, it will still have zero uh, solutions. It's possible that this is a stable, stable uh, situation. But this type of argument doesn't exactly work in that case. Okay, We have to uh, come up with different tools. Yes, Shogata. Yes. There is, so that's why I'm saying, like, uh, so precise, that's precisely what Shogata is saying. There it's, I, I, I don't want you to take uh, this uh, blackboard as a message over QP. So please do not, but take it as a, a fill. So what I wrote uh, in these uh, blackboards, it's, uh, it can be turned into a rigorous argument. But over QP, we need to just uh, be a little bit more careful. What it's true, it is we still get uh, open sets inside our parameter space uh, with the property that if you perturb a little bit, we get some type of uh, fiber. And then there are other open sets where we get a different type of fiber. But you cannot really say that like the discriminant disconnects your set. And this talking about stratification also could be a little bit uh, delicate. OK, so we arrived at this point. So the idea is, yes. Uh, you mean like, uh, um, what are you going to get? In it depends. So that's the point. So now it depends. Uh, so we arrived at the point where I said the idea is uh, we have to put the probability measure in our space. Okay? But now comes a choice. So when I just say this is uh, some idea that I'd like to convey, like in the complex framework, you don't even to think about this. If you put the probability measure, which is reasonable, meaning that absolutely continue with respect to Lebesgue, after all, the parameter space is a manifold. Whatever type of questions you study, it doesn't matter. So it doesn't depend on the measure. But on this side, if you put a, a probability measure, which is reasonable, so absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue, the answer depends on the measure, of course. So this it is precisely a point of the theory. So at some point, if you want to switch from generic to random and you want to endow P with the probability measure, this measure is a choice. Is a choice that you make. 
It's like when you look at a, at, a, at a vector space and you put a Euclidean structure on it because you want to turn it into a, a metric space. You make a choice. What I want to argue now, it is that in most cases of interest, the choice is natural and it's dictated by some uh, geometry of the problem. Okay? So, of course, in the end, as Alicia was asking, we want to formulate statements that help us understanding the picture, the big picture, if you want. So, uh, help us understanding what a structure of the discriminant. And if we want to make such a statement, we have to make, we have to choose the probability measure in a reasonable way, or in a way that will help us phrasing some results or understanding the picture. Okay? I, will, I have to discuss this point now. Okay? So it's very important that we make a, a choice. And as I said, uh, ouch, I don't know how to, maybe I'll just continue here. Um, so, this is a good question, how to endow our parameter space with a probability distribution. Okay, so this is precisely, so we are at this point where we know that uh, over a non-algebraically closed field in our parameter space we have a bunch of open sets which are stable by perturbations but a bunch of open sets giving different outcomes. We want to turn this uh, uh, picture into a measure theoretic frame, uh, picture, so we need to add some measure to this uh, object. How do we do that? So that's, uh, well, see, as I said, in most of the cases, uh, P will be our parameter space, a smooth manifold, okay? So one, uh, uh, I'll just argue first with the simplest way sometimes is also a natural way. So P usually also comes with the Riemannian metric. And if uh, the volume of P with respect to this Riemannian metric is finite, a way to put a measure is the following, I call it mu P of a set. I just define it by the volume of this set divided by the volume of P. Okay, so I just normalize uh, the Riemannian volume of, your sp of my space. In most cases, uh, this is a natural choice. For instance, uh, if you take uh, the unit sphere with the standard metric, uh, so here's the picture. Okay, we sit inside our n plus one. So the sphere has some finite volume. So remember like uh, whenever we get a Riemannian matrix on a smooth manifold, we can talk about the corresponding Riemannian density. Okay, so we can talk about volume on this manifold. And uh, we can just measure the size of a set, which is the relative fraction of area that this set covers on the sphere. I call, by the way, this distribution, uh, this uh, measure, I call it the uniform measure. So that's the name that we call it. Of course, it depends on the Riemannian metric, clearly. But in most cases, I will just uh, have in mind some underlying uh, chosen Riemannian metric. This is what happens under sphere. You know, the sphere projects uh, onto the projected space through a Riemannian submersion. It doesn't have to be a Riemannian submersion, just projects. That's uh, the thing that matters. And uh, the measure that we have here is measure on Sn, so the uniform measure. We can push forward it to the measure on the real projected space. Okay, so, and uh, what is the push forward? It's simply this, uh, the measure of an open set in projective space uh, is just a measure on the sphere of the image of this set, okay? So this uh, way of defining a measure through a map, it's called the push forward measure, okay? 
So we have a measurable map. In most of the case, it's going to be a smooth map. And I know how to measure here. And the map goes here. How do we measure sets here? Simply, I take a set here, take its pre-image, and I measure it here. Okay, so this is called a push-forward measure. Um, I need to erase the blackboard now. Use this one. Here is another example, which is uh, useful for us. <coughs> Take, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the orthogonal group that sits inside a space of square matrices. And now let's put the remaining structure in this group. So let's just uh, take uh, the remaining structure to be just a restriction. Okay, on O n. And here we can just take, for instance, uh, the Frobenius scalar product on the space of matrices. So Frobenius scalar product induces a remaining structure on the space of square matrices. Uh, we restrict this remaining structure to O n, that means we measure length of tangent vectors to O n according to their length in the space of symmetric matrices, and we turn O n into a Riemannian manifold. And the corresponding measure, which we call the, uh, the uniform measure, turns out to be the R measure. And the reason is simply that uh, this construction here is orthogonal invariant. And up to multiples, the R measure is the unique one, which is uh, invariant by the action of ON, so by left translation. So in, this, in all these cases, this was uh, quite natural. Uh, now, if you want, uh, SN parametrizes uh, directions in Rn plus 1. RPN parameterizes lines in uh, Rn plus 1. OK, I don't know what to say, but orthogonal group parameterizes rotation. This is, these are already uh, parameter spaces. Here is something more interesting, which will play a role for us. Uh, so is how do we put a measure on the simplest family of, actually, uh, object, which is Grassmannians. By the way, so far, there is no discriminant. I'm just telling you, if you want, in this space, before I knew there was some discriminant, I'm just putting a measure. No discriminant yet. I'm just telling for the objects uh, which we are going to be interested in, which are object parametrizing a family of objects, what type of uh, probability measure is it natural to consider? Okay? On Grassmannian, so let me call GKN. This is like k planes in Rn. I, you see, now comes uh, uh, something into the theory. Like when we make this choice, we want the choice to be natural. Okay? What uh, can, uh, what properties do you want uh, a measure on a Grassmannian have in order to be natural? Well, yes. Invariant under the action by the orthogonal group. Okay, so the orthogonal group ON acts on GKN, and we would like to put a measure which is invariant under this action. Okay, so this, uh, you see, in most of the cases, the choice of the measure it's kind of dictated by sanity. Okay, and in this case, again, there is a unique ON invariant measure on the Grassmannian, which we denoted again as before in this way. Let's be careful. Just uh, I don't want to write this on the blackboard because I don't want you to get confused. The fact that there is a unique invariant measure 
it's different from the fact that there is a unique invariant Riemannian structure, which is not true. Okay? So for instance, on the Grassmannian G24, there is a unique invariant measure, but there is not a unique invariant Riemannian structure. There is actually a family of invariant structures. Okay? This is related to representation theory. Okay? But the fact that there is a unique invariant measure, it's another story. Okay? So I agree that I introduced uh, this uniform measure through uh, a Riemannian structure, but just keep in mind that imposing a measure, it's much less than imposing a Riemannian structure. And if you ask for uh, uh, invariant Riemannian structures, not true that there is a unique one, up to multiples, of course. But measure, it is true. There is a unique one up to multiples. So a unique probability measure, if you normalize. And how do we build it? Well, I'll just give you uh, several constructions on how to build it. So you choose uh, for the rest uh, of the course uh, the one you prefer, okay, to keep in mind. Well, first of all, through a Riemannian metric. Well, we do this. Uh, we take G, K, N. We embed it, if you want, into the projective space through the Plucker embedding. Or maybe we could even, okay, let's do this. Maybe this is better for a second. Let's take the gross minion of oriented K planes. We embed it into the unit sphere. We restrict the Riemannian metric from this embedding. We get a Riemannian metric on this, we put a measure, and then we double cover the Grassmannian, and we take the push forward measure. That's one possibility. So through Riemannian structure. An equivalent possibility, again, through Riemannian structure is just view GKN as the quotient through a Riemannian submersion. So view it as the image of a Riemannian submersion. So you put a metric on ON, maybe that metric over there. Uh, and then uh, you can, uh, because the stabilizer here acts by isometries, uh, this metric descends to the quotient, induces the Grassmannian with uh, a Riemannian structure. The map becomes a Riemannian submersion. You can put a measure here. So this would be one way. Another way, if you like it more, Using the orthogonal group, I define a map from ON to the Grassmannian. Simply do the following, take an element and just do G times RK, your favorite RK. So fix some RK. Now move, this is the action map, move the RK. Okay, so we get a map from the orthogonal group to the Grassmannian. Here we have the R measure, take the push forward of this R measure. So, the measure of a set in the Grassmannian is the measure of the set of rotations okay, that correspond to this set, that bring the fixed RK to this set. Another way, maybe, it's through Gaussian variables, but I will get back to this in a second. I don't want you to be scared now with these Gaussian variables. Okay, so this is. These are all equivalent ways of building a measure on the Grassmannian. But uh, if you want to think about, I think uh, the simplest one is really this one. I mean, at least from my point of view. Okay, so you have the orthogonal group which acts on the Grassmannian. So you have this map from the orthogonal group, I don't know how to depict it in a better way, to the Grassmannian, okay? And uh, you just, this is the action you push forward the measure to this action. So if you want to know, so you have to fix one point, of course, to determine the action. So this, let's say it's a fixed RK, okay? And if you want to know what's the size of some set in the Grassmannian, okay? What is the probability that uh, an element from the Grassmannian lies in this set? We do the following. We take this set back under the action. So this would be the set of G, orthogonal transformation, which brings RK into this set of hyperplanes, and we take the uh, R measure of this set. Okay, so this would be the way. 
It's a good way, by the way, because uh, somehow this idea of push forward measures, uh, it's related to a concept in uh, probability theory, which is the concept of random variable. It's a remark that I want to put here. You don't have to be scared, by the way, by when I say probability theory, because as you will see, what we're really doing is just this. So this is the amount of probability that we will need. Maybe just a remark. What is a random variable? Well, we simply have a space with some measure. And the random variable is a map to our space, which is measurable. Which means that the image of an open set is measurable. Okay, so notice the analogy with a continuous map. A continuous map would be the preimage of an open set is open. And measurable map would be the preimage of an open set is measurable. Okay? So in this language, you see that this map from here to here, it is a random variable. It's a random variable with values in the Grassmannian. Because we have the probability space, which is the orthogonal group with the uniform measure. And we have a map to the Grassmannian. And this map is measurable. It's continuous, in fact. Continuous maps are measurable, by definition. Because, uh, I mean, at least if uh, the probability measure here is defined on the sigma algebra of Borel sets, uh, the preimage of an open set uh, would be open, which is measurable. So no worries about this. So do not worry at all uh, about uh, um, uh, deep uh, um, measure theoretic questions. Okay, now comes uh, the deal. Of course, you see in all these examples, uh, the parameter space uh, was a compact space. What if it is not a compact space? What if it is a vector space? So what if now P is a vector space? Okay. How do we put a, a measure on a vector space? Of course, we could put the bag measure, but this is not a probability measure because uh, it is, uh, there are arbitrary large uh, uh, sets of uh, sets of arbitrary large the bag measure. So one way. Uh, for us, the most natural way would be through the notion of standard Gaussian measure. Okay. I denote it by gamma n, so it's a measure, probability measure on Rn, defined by the following. If I want to know what's the measure, what's the probability of some Borel set, this is just going to be 1 over 2 pi n over 2 integral over e, e to the minus norm of x squared over 2 dx1 dxn. This is called the standard Gaussian measure. In other words, maybe little bit better to write it this way. I'm integrating over Rn, over E, sorry, not the Lebesgue measure, which would not make it uh, of uh, total volume one, but this uh, Gaussian measure. And this, of course, uh, it's what makes it total volume one. Okay? But, okay, one remark, there is a connection between uh, this measure on Rn 
and the uniform measure on the sphere. Okay? And I think like, if you've taken a class in uh, calculus, you would know that uh, this measure gamma n in polar coordinates, uh, it's just uh, up to a constant. Okay? It's just the uniform measure on the sphere times, uh, uh, so it's e to the minus rho squared over 2 d rho. So here I'm just saying that uh, if you take the polar coordinate maps uh, from theta rho, okay, so two polar coordinates, this is in our n, the push forward of this measure under the polar coordinates is the Gaussian measure. Okay, so like. For instance, if you, if you in, the, in R2, for instance, if you have a cone centered at the origin and you want to measure the probability of this cone with respect to the Gaussian measure, it is the same as taking the intersection of this cone with the sphere and just measure with respect to the uniform measure on the sphere the fraction that this cone covers on the sphere. Okay? This will work with cones. It's a good observation, by the way, especially for us, because in our case, the vector space will be the space of polynomials, for instance, and we will be interested in their zero set. Okay? And the zero set is constant throughout uh, a cone. If you take a polynomial and it's multiples, uh, it, they all have the same zero set. Okay? So in some sense, uh, it's good to keep in mind that the Gaussian measure, it's practical to work with, uh, but in the end, uh, it just boils down to the uniform measure on the uh, sphere. Okay? And by the way, that's a, a, a good observation because uh, there is a connection between Gaussian measures uh, and uh, scalar products. Okay, there are these two objects, uh, if you want, uh, they are two faces uh, of the same uh, object. In which sense? So, how do you put a Gaussian measure on, not Rn, on some vector space? Well, just simply take a linear map from Rn with the standard Gaussian structure to your space and push forward the measure from Rn. Okay, so a Gaussian space would just be a space where your measure is the push forward of the Gaussian measure through a surjective linear map. It doesn't have to be surjective in general, but I want it to be surjective. So this would be the definition of what is called a non-degenerate Gaussian space. Now, I want to argue that uh, this construction here, so putting a Gaussian measure on a uh, vector space, it's the same as putting a, a scalar product on this vector space. Okay? So, see, if I take a scalar product on V, then I can take an orthonormal basis, for this a scalar product. And then I can define my map from Rn by just sending Ei to Vi. So I just identify my space through the an orthonormal basis with Rn. Okay? So they become the same space. And vice versa, if I have this map which is surjective, you can get, get back to this construction by simply restricting h to the orthogonal complement of its kernel, which gives an isomorphism between v and rn, and then you just uh, induce, uh, the because they are isomorphic space, uh, you just consider the scalar product uh, under this isomorphism, okay? So, I, it, this idea, will we'll play a role in a while. So the idea that like uh, 
Choosing a Gaussian measure on a space, it's the same as choosing a scalar product on it. And it's particularly practical because uh, it, uh, it allows to, see, when you are on a vector space and you take, uh, I agree, also for, I, I was, I was speeding up. I agree, Alicia. Yes, I say it again, okay? So, from a scalar product on V, I want to put, uh, let's just look at this implication, a Gaussian measure on V. How? Well, take an orthonormal basis for this scalar product. Okay? You choose it. Then define the map H from Rn to your space, which sends the ith standard basic vector to Vi. Okay? This map, this map push forward the Gaussian measure to the measure you want to define. Uh, let me phrase it in maybe better way. Uh, yes? Such as the formula you want it, by taking the, the norm. By taking the other norm, exactly. One just have to be careful about the normalization constant. That's it. But another way maybe which is practical is the following. Um, let me define a random variable with values in my vector space, okay? You have your basis, and now consider this vector. Xi1 V1 plus, plus Xi n V n, okay? So this is a random variable. So map, so where Xi1, Xi n are Gaussian. So this is a map from some probability space to our V. So it's a random variable with values in V. And now take the induced probability distribution. So the gamma V of some open set, it is just the probability that your random variable belongs to your open set. Again, another description as uh, Michel was saying, you have your scalar product, then you define, these are all equivalent descriptions, the probability, so the measure of an open set, okay, there is a normalization constant, but would just be the integral on your open set, and then you have a chosen scalar product, okay? It's your chosen scalar product, okay? And if you think about the change of variable formula, if you take this map from Rn to here, this density, you can write it in these uh, x1, xn variables in this way, okay? If you use an orthonormal basis. Okay, how many? Two minutes, good. So how to put then a probability measure on the space of polynomials? I'll just finish with this and then we keep discussing this in the next lecture. What about when V is the space of homogeneous polynomials of degree D. See, here again we have to make a choice. In the previous examples we didn't have, I mean the choice was somehow like forced by the geometry of our parameter space. 
And I claim that here also the choice is suggested by the geometry of parameter space. See, this is not just any vector space. It's a vector space which carries a natural action of the orthogonal group. So the orthogonal group represents into my space of polynomials by change of variables. So take g and send it to rho of g. So this is a it's a, it's a linear transformation of my space to itself. And rho g sends a polynomial p to p composed with g minus 1. Okay, so you can act on your space of polynomials by change of variables. And remember, we will be interested in, in the zero set of a polynomial. So this action brings, uh, so there is some zero set maybe in Rpn. Okay, it brings it to another zero set, the zero set. So this would be the zero set of the polynomial P, and this would be the zero set of the polynomial P composed by G minus 1. But this is nothing than G of the zero set of P. Okay, so the orthogonal group acts on the space of polynomials by change of variables, but also on the domain, if you want, of these polynomials by rotations in this case. So what is natural here is to put a probability measure which is invariant under this action. This would be a natural choice. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, now there is a whole family of such uh, probability measures. Okay? It's not just that there is one possible choice. And the reason it is that this uh, representation is not irreducible. Okay? I will discuss this in the next lecture. On the other end, uh, over the complex numbers, this representation is irreducible, and there is only one possibility of putting a Gaussian measure, which is invariant under this action. Okay? I will, see, I will discuss this uh, in the next lecture. I stop here.